Hello and welcome to NARC Live on Wednesday the 23rd of November 2022. Is it just me or is it cold? It's cold. Anyway, we've got Tammy M0TC. Hello. And me, David G7RP. Lovely to be with you again. On tonight's show, Fred V1FA joins us live from Canada to present the design and operation of the Titanic's radio, a pinnacle of Spark technology. Exclusive, we have Summer Wine Gang member Paul G3VPT, who's been looking out for birds. Maybe I shouldn't have read it like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we find out what on earth this is. We've had a few entries, but we've foxed most people, I think. If you have an idea, think. Can we give any clues? No, it's not fair, no. is it, to the others? But it's not what you think, is what it's fair to say. Only be certain types of people who'll know what that is. Anyway, we'll come to that. If you think you know what it is, pop it onto BATC or to Facebook and we'll read them out with the other answers. But first, we've got some club news for you. And first, our congratulations to the candidates who passed their foundation license with us last Saturday. This was the first club in course, in person meeting um, with the, for the club for nearly three years and it's the first under the new syllabus which now incorporates things like software defined radio and EMF the ICNA regulations so it's quite different so as well as congratulations to those candidates uh, who passed um, sincere thanks and congratulations also I'm sure you'd want me to pass to our training team who've done a lot to adapt to these new uh, this new syllabus and for taking it on board. It is quite a change. I think most people would agree, actually, even though there's still only 26 questions. They're, they're a little bit more challenging than they were, I think. Now, we'll be looking at running in-person courses again next year, some more, um, but it's uh, a reminder to everybody, really, now that you can teach yourself and you can book your own exams online. That's for all three levels. And very soon, I think it's the beginning of next year, there's also a full course for going from foundation to advance so just to bear that in mind of course we will be running courses but uh, as a lot of people have in the last couple of years you can now do all of it online yourself and you don't have to have any practical assessments for any of the levels and I mentioned ICNAP a minute ago as being part of the new course and exam but it's a reminder that these regulations now apply to HF bands too as of actually last Friday I think it was the 18th of November so essentially it applies to all UK amateur bands now and that means it applies to all UK amateurs not just found you know some people I think that foundation holders can only run 10 watts so it can't be a problem but of course you get gain from antenna which which could take you over the limit so it actually applies to everybody and there's a lot more um, advanced and easier to use uh, uh, tools now available to do it as well the RSGB have been leading this and um, actually, if I can ask Tammy to put the caption up on the screen, this is where you can go to access any of these tools. You don't have to be a member of the RSGB to do that. rsgb.org forward slash EMF. And there's a very good online calculator now in particular, which covers lots of antennas uh, for most of the bands. Um, and you can print out your own report and do it really relatively simply, as long as you know what type of aerial it is, what type of feeder and uh, the height above ground and that sort of thing so do have a look at that now it does apply to all of us and it applies on all bands um, and also I just mentioned I saw an ad the other day that the RSGB EMC committee are actually looking for new members so if this is something that you understand quite well and you're willing to help um, then you don't have to be an expert on EMC you just have to be a, a radio amateur obviously and, and have some experience of this type of thing but they're looking for extra volunteers to join them now, on to our Christmas party. I've been mentioning this for several NARC Lives. I think this is the third one now, but there's only one week to go before the deadline for booking. So here are the details again. It's our Christmas dinner party. It's on Wednesday, the 14th of December at seven o'clock. It's seven till 10, by the way, for those who've asked me recently what time. It's a seven o'clock arrival, 7.30, the starters will be served, um, and we're there until 10 o'clock we've booked this big room there for NARC members and friends and family as well as I said it's a three course meal £10 a head being subsidised by the club and the booking form is on the website or in your newsletters 
or you can pick one up next Wednesday the 30th of November because that is the last deadline. There will be paper versions there which you can pick up and pay by cash if you wish. But that is the deadline next Wednesday because then I've got to enter it all onto a spreadsheet for the restaurant and then they, they put it all together and serve it to us on the Wednesday the 14th. So I hope lots of you will join then. And incidentally, um, our membership is now due. Um, and on that form as well, if you want to, you can combine the paying for your dinner along with membership for next year. But if not, you can still rejoin us. I hope you will. It's just £10 for the whole of the year for 2023. As I said several weeks ago now, you have kept the price really low. It's never, ever been this low in my memory, and I've been a member of the club for well over 20 years. Uh, Roger tells me that maybe in the 80s it was something like £10. It's normally been 20 to £30. But it's because we have such a high membership now and not quite as many expenses because we don't meet at the school every week. But we hope everybody is going to rejoin who's been a member this year and then we can make all the sums add up. Details of how to join or rejoin are on our website. That's the best place to look, which is at www.norfolkamateurradio.org. Again, you can also pay in cash in person next week at the club if you just go to where the canteen is and say you'd like to pay your membership for next year, that's how to do it. And now a few bits of news from you, our members. So firstly, it was great to see Paul G4 VLS at the club meeting last week. He said he hasn't been able to go because his wife's been very poorly the last couple of years. And uh, this is the first time he's been, I think, since um, before COVID. So he was able to come and he also brought one of these as a sample. Now, I'm going to show it up to this oh, camera. That sounds wrong. You brought it as a sample. No, it's not, it's not full. It's got nothing <laughs> in it. Okay, this is a lovely, useful container. He thought ideal for electronic components and things like that. And he's got lots of them, basically. I think they had peaches in them originally, but they've all been washed up. And he just thought they're too good to throw away. So if you've got, you want to sort out your shack or your workshop for storing components or nails or something like that in, he has many of these and they're free to good home. He says he's got a couple of bin liners full. That's what he said to me. So if you would like any of these, um, drop me a line if you like to the usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com. Say how many you'd like and I'll ask Paul and hopefully he'll be coming next Wednesday and he can bring them along to the club and you can collect them or make other arrangements as well. Now we've had some news as well from Bob G6PWS. Uh, he and nine others spent Remembrance Weekend in Ypres for the Ypres, sorry, for the service at the Menin Gate. And these are some of the pictures from there. The service was on Friday the 11th at 11 o'clock at the church there. And on Saturday they went on a tour of the area including Hill 62 and the Bay and Wold trenches as well. I think you saw the trenches on the first slide. Thanks for sending us those pictures, Bob. And finally, from news from you, from Bob G7 JTZ of the Summer Wine Gang. Uh, he had a visitor this morning, and it's Bob, it's Paul, sorry, G3 VPT, who had his camera out. Have a look at this. And this is the message. It says the heron is still left hungry when he left. He couldn't reach the fishes. And it's not the first time he's been and failed to reach the fish. I feel a bit sorry for him, don't you? Yeah. He looks I put Paul forlorn. on there. I thought it was Paul, not Bob. Paul took the picture, I think, but oh, it's Bob's right. garden, I believe. Right. Okay, fair enough. Um, anyway, he said that the heron, or well, he said he was 150 millimetres above the water and the pond is one to three metres down. I guess he meant the heron, not Paul. So... <laughs> <laughs> and it has straight sides to the bottom. Again, I hope that means the, the pond, not Paul. <laughs> anyway, you know what I mean. Thank you very much for sending it that to us, guys. And with that, little people. Little people, yep. Here's little people for this week. Ooh. A motorcycle. I like it. Made S out of protractors. St well, stationary, yes. Oh, stationary, is it? Okay. Oh, and the pencil and handlebars? Yep. It's good stuff, isn't it? Some squares, some... Pens. I oh, think yeah, there might even be a stapler, possibly, that his feet are on, or oh, staples. Yeah. It's always ingenious how they do it, isn't it? I love the pencil, though, for the handlebar. I think mm. that's good. As we always say, the this website is a Japanese website, and they create something like this every single day, and Tammy picks one out for us. And if you want to see more of what they do, go to this address, miniature-calendar.com. 
So what have you been doing? We've had pictures from some of you, but um, to be honest, we don't get as much news as we did. And now maybe the weather's not so good, um, you know, and you're not going out quite as much. We would love to hear from you. It keeps us all connected in Norfolk Amateur Radio Club. So don't forget to send those pictures to us to this address, radio at dcpmicro.com. If you send them to us by three o'clock on the day of NARC Live, which is roughly every other week, then we'll try and include them in that programme or in a show shortly afterwards. And of course our card as well, our NARC card, which we're always happy to send to anybody who you think will be cheered. We sent one this week actually to one of our members who's in hospital, not feeling too good at the moment. If you want a celebration or anything like that, not as uh, I think it was Steve the other day said he was going to send us a list of his Christmas card <laughs> list to send that. Although actually thinking about it, we do we do have a Christmas version. Tammy created one last year for us and I think we could do that this year. So as a serious point, not your whole family and friends list, but if you do know somebody who maybe is on their own or just maybe not feeling still part of you know, a happy world, then we will be very happy to send them a Christmas card as well. We're happy to print it and post it for you. All you've got to do is send us their details to this address, radio at dcpmicro.com. Don't forget to mention whether you'd like it to be a Christmas card or whether it's a get well card or something like that. We'll be very happy to do it. Okay, now before we meet tonight's guest, it's time for that competition again. And uh, two weeks ago, we showed you this picture and said, what on earth is this? Oh, no, the trouble is when this came in, I immediately saw what it is because the person put it on there, which is fine. But you know, if they hadn't have told me, I don't think I'd have got it, to be honest. And yet I should know what it is. Flower pot. Flower pot, yeah, exactly. <laughs> have we had any guesses online? I no, we this, haven't. I just way. had a look. No, we haven't. No, okay. No, we haven't had any guesses. Okay, so this is what we had. These are people wrote in. I wonder if they're right. Bruce G4KZT says, if I hadn't recently visited a pet shop, I wouldn't have had a clue what this was. But he says, I think it's a dog feeding bowl designed to slow down the eating process. The dog has to lick the food out of the loops instead of just woofing it down. Bob G6PWS, it's a slow feeded bowl for dogs or pets. The bowl is designed to slow down rapid eating, anti choking, and slow down the eating time, helping prevent obesity, bloating, regurgitation, and overeating and other unmentionables at mealtime. It helped our little Staffy, who used to try and beat the rest of the pack. Yeah, I think the name was Lily of that. Yeah, Bob, that's uh, that's good. Okay, so that's two down. Colin G M zero G M K says, I think this is a slow dog feeding dish. I presume that means the dog is forced to take its time eating, and not that the dog is slow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andy M zero N K R. I think the item is a slow feed dog bowl. Okay, that's all we've had. Four guesses. That's a long time since we've had only four guesses for this. So let's reveal what it is. It is Tammy. Well, it is a slow eat bowl. It is. That's right. Um, Paul sent us it's a dog feeding bowl to prevent the dog gulping down in a few seconds the entire meal. I'm glad you said that, Paul, because if not, if you hadn't have explained it fully, I wondered if that was what Elizabeth would have given you to slow you down <laughs> eating or something. We know people who eat fast and wouldn't it slow them down. I did buy one for our cat, but unfortunately... Um, <laughs> I put wet food in it rather than dry and he just got very confused and muddled and oh, he just yeah. tried to tip it. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it is confusing, so. I guess. And it, it's probably very frustrating, but it does do the job. Yeah. If it's instead of forcing it down so much. I think they're really designed for dry food. Yeah, but it is a but good, yeah. it was a really good sort of, that's exactly the sort of thing we really want people to send on what to what on earth is this. And we've not got too many. We've got a few. We get them almost week by week just one or two just keeps us going but if you've got something like that or you get something in the next few weeks or maybe you see something over Christmas please send it to us because we'll keep this competition rolling as long as you keep sending something to us if you see something unusual and think I bet they won't know what that is that's the time to send it anyway let's now have a look at the next competition pro uh, entry uh, uh, rather picture and ask you what on earth is this I reckon this is tricky. I've even corresponded with the person concerned, but there we are. That is, would it be fair to say it's a tool? Yeah. And if I said it was just in time for Christmas, that's all I can say. Smile from my wife. 
<laughs> All right, so there we are. That's this on What on Earth. We'll be back in two weeks' time. If you could know what that is, or you can get a, have a good guess, then let us know. Send your answers to radio at dcpmicro.com by three o'clock on Wednesday week. And we'll read it out. Good luck. And I'll be staggered and seriously impressed if you can get what that is. Okay. Just before we meet our guest in tonight, let's just uh, have a look and see what's on at the club this week. On Sunday, we've got the GB2RS News on GB3MB at 7 o'clock. Monday night, the uh, NARC... Monday night Narknet on GB3MB at half past seven. And at half past eight, the 80 meter CW net on 3.543 megahertz. And then next Wednesday, the 30th of November, it's actually our last meeting at CNS for this year. Uh, we'll be in our usual sixth form common room. There will be an informal workshop on repeaters with Mark G0LGJ from the Norfolk Repeater Group and also James M0ZAH is hoping to be there to talk about his team wave group which runs some very interesting repeaters. I was on their net last night finding out more about it and uh, it basically mixes technology. So if you like digital and you want to get onto an analog repeater or talk to somebody who hasn't got digital, you can do it. Really looks very interesting. And Mark will be explaining as well how the rest of the repeater network works over the country, it's, it, uh, over the county. It is very informal. It's what we're calling a round table. Physically, you just get round the table and look. Last week we had it with uh, James, M0 UKS, who showed us his Christmas lights, very popular. Had about a dozen people or so looking around. There's also Bright Sparks next week for our young members. And also a social informal if you don't, if neither of these things interest you and you just want to meet and have a chat. But that's next Wednesday, the 30th of November, and the last time we meet. And of course, don't forget, it's the deadline as well for booking the Christmas dinner party as well. And don't forget to keep sending us your details and use your stories and the entries for What on Earth, because we'll be back here in two weeks' time, as I said. So... Let's now meet our guest this evening. Now, we're going, oh, we're going over live to Canada now, to Fred VE1FA. And he's going to be telling us an incredible story about the Titanic's radio. But I'm not going to say much more than that, because we're going to meet the man himself. Hello, Fred. Hello. Uh, I'm pleased to be there, uh, David. And uh, yeah, I, I hope it's, uh, I think a lot of it will be new information for people. By the way, I've got, a, I've got a what on earth out in the garage. I'm sorry I'm not a member of your club. I'd, I'd send you a picture. Well, you do. You can, honestly. You don't have to be a member of our club. We, we, we encourage everybody to, uh, you know, to anybody to watch this, this show. Um, so if you'd like to send it to me, don't tell them what it is, though, now. Do take a picture no, no. of it. Um, and don't forget as well to tell me what it is, because sometimes people send it and think it's a game for me. The only That is quite nice in some ways, but then if I don't know what it is, I'm not going to be able to help when it comes to giving the answers. But yeah, please do send it. It's a nice little competition we do. Anyway, it's really good to meet you, Fred. We were comparing notes on the weather about, um, oh, so just over, under an hour ago, weren't we? And you said it's uh, similarly getting cold where you are in, in Canada. Whereabouts are you? Uh, I'm in Nova Scotia, which is on the east coast. It's uh, well, Newfoundland is a little, little bit further east, but other than that, we're we're close to the easternmost part of Canada. It's it's a an almost island. Uh, I was going to say it's about the size of uh, uh, Maine, but that probably doesn't help you over there. It's it's a good sized province, no, not like the western ones, but uh, strong English influence around here. Most of the uh, uh, city names, Halifax, Yarmouth, Falmouth, so forth. They're all here as well. Oh, yeah. Well, Yarmouth, that, that is, uh, Yarmouth is uh, in our county, Norfolk, here. It's about from mm -hmm. here, about 30 miles, I guess, something like that. So it's very much, and you've just, you, you, your daughter's in, in, uh, in Newcastle in England, isn't she? Yes. Uh, yeah, our daughter, Anne, is a, an astrophysicist, and uh, she finished her schooling over here at McGill in Montreal, and then she spent uh, several years in Holland and was offered a job at uh, uh, the Uni in Newcastle, England. So we spent most of September in Newcastle. And uh, we we like England a lot. We've been over quite a few times, starting with me on a BSA in 1969. Mm, oh. But uh, anyway, uh, we also have uh, we have relatives. We've got a couple of cousins in Edinburgh. So anyway, we yeah. had a uh, uh, I'd never seen into the north uh, northeast corner of the UK. So this uh, uh, and uh, our daughter has a friend who took us all around Newcastle and to the north and to the south. And uh, anyway, very enjoyable. And we'll certainly be back. Lovely. Well, OK, well, it's lovely to welcome you to Knock Live as well tonight from from your home in Canada. And we're looking forward 
very much to hearing about the incredible story of the radio to Titanic. Just a, a reminder to everybody now at home though, watching, uh, you can ask questions and make comments at any time for Fred. Do it during, the, uh, during his presentation or straight afterwards, and of course we'll read them to Fred at the end. But now over to you, Fred, and we look forward to the story of the Titanic radio. Okay, thank you, David. And uh, yeah, I hope this is of interest. Uh, you can see on the first slide, uh, there's really three interesting things to talk about. And uh, the first time I gave this talk, I tried to talk about all three. And that's just there's just too much there. So this will be primarily the technical side, how the radio and the Titanic worked. And uh, the other two will come into it a little bit at the end. But let me just say that uh, uh, the disaster of the t Titanic had a tremendous impact on the course of radio, both amateur and commercial and military for that matter. So here's the Titanic at the, the dock. Uh, it could be Cherbourg. It's probably Southampton uh, before it, it heads off on a, a very unfortunate voyage. Um, we'll go back to the beginning of radio for this. And uh, this is the first transmitter and receiver. And it was discovered uh, or developed and proven by uh, one uh, Heinrich Hertz, uh, a German scientist. And what he was trying to do was not discover a new method of communication, but uh, there's a famous uh, British scientist, James Clerk Maxwell, uh, who was a, a strong physicist and he was an even stronger mathematician. He showed mathematically and with some, some data from the physical world that uh, light was probably electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and uh, his theory, it, nobody could uh, disprove his mathematics, but uh, he really didn't have any evidence. And he, and he said that there may well be electromagnetic radiation at other frequencies as well. But again, it, it, unfortunately, Maxwell died before this, this experiment was done. But uh, Hertz's objective was to prove that Maxwell was correct, that it was electromagnetic, that there were radio waves uh, of electromagnetic radiation. This is his uh, uh, experiment here. And it's really just a, a vibrator, an interrupter. Uh, and what, oh, okay, I'll go ahead. This here is basically analogous to the spark coil that uh, cars had from almost the beginning of cars till very recently when electronics were added. So you have an interrupter as the contacts in the distributor would uh, were interrupted. So the, when the field collapses here, you produce a large induced voltage, which uh, produces a spark between the, in this spark gap here. And these two plates can be thought of as a capacitor here. And uh, he saw what he saw was a, a ring placed about a meter away in the first experiment, it showed a tiny spark at the gap when a spark jumped here. So somehow, at some very great speed, uh, uh, radiation from these plates, uh, when the spark jumped here, ended up activating the ring. And given the uh, circumference of the ring, the diameter of the ring, uh, we know that the very first radio signal then was sent at about 300 megahertz. Anyway, this was just an experiment, and he, did, he found that as he moved the, the ring further and further away from the quote-unquote transmitter, um, it was more and more difficult. He could only make this thing work for, for a distance of a few meters in his lab. And so he came out with the un unfortunate quote, I do not think that radio waves I have discovered, the radio waves I've discovered, will have any practical application. Uh, he actually had a relatively short life, probably somewhat uh, fortunate for him, because I can imagine any number of people coming up to him in the 20s or the 30s saying, well, what do you think of your prediction? Uh, at any rate, he didn't know about grounding, and he didn't know about uh, uh, a big power transmitter, and he didn't know about uh, large antennas. So he can be forgiven. Uh, probably because I'm, I'm a, a biologist, uh, I tend to think of it as uh, uh, a bit uh, the, the spark transmitter that I just showed you is a dinosaur. And uh, you can divide basically all radio up into, I, I believe, what you could call three living and three extinct species. The, the spark, which is what the Titanic used, uh, as we'll see in detail shortly, uh, 1887 up to the early 20s, uh, it's now extinct and illegal. It's extinct because it's very inefficient and it's illegal 
because it's uh, the signals are enormously wide. Uh, uh, sometimes people say the signal from any one spark transmitter is DC to daylight. Uh, as they went along, they got better. But uh, in the early days, you could only use one transmitter in a particular physical area because it, it just filled it filled the spectrum as far as they knew the spectrum. Uh, the second device was the RF alternator. And this was developed by uh, a Swedish engineer, uh, Alex Anderson, when he was working for General Electric in Schenectady, New York. That was a huge plant at the time and they were building uh, transformers for the uh, emerging grid, electrical grid. And uh, anyway, he, he came up with the idea that they did realize with Spark that Spark was a very inefficient way. And what they wanted and what they understood from quite an early date was that a continuous wave is what they wanted. And the Spark was like striking a bell. You, you get a, a few cycles and then it, it, it damps out, it dies out. Uh, so the alternator solved that beautifully. The RF alternator would keep a clean carrier going for as long as you had the fuel to run the, uh, run the uh, uh, alternator. The trouble was that uh, uh, they were trying to produce RF frequencies mechanically a big electric motor driving this big alternator. And they had hundreds of tiny poles in it. Uh, but the best they could do, as far as I know, the highest frequency Alexander Anderson alternator was at 17.2 kilohertz. Uh, there were other ones down to 12 kilohertz. So they worked beautifully. But uh, as you can all appreciate, there's a lot of problems if your uh, frequencies are all in this range. Uh, they're actually... Um, had one uh, strength, and for that reason, they were used uh, through World War II uh, and were very useful. And that is that at 17, 12 to 17 kilohertz, the uh, signals uh, are transmitted through salt water very efficiently. So these were a great way to contact submarines. Now, it was it was one-way communication, of course, because a sub, there's no way a submarine could have something like a, a 200 kilowatt, 50 ton uh, Alexanderson uh, alternator aboard but uh, they could talk. And uh, unfortunately, when the Germans took over uh, Poland in 1939, they discovered one, uh, well, they knew it was there and they went to it quite quickly and uh, uh, set it into operation. And, and this Polish Alexanderson was what they used to contact their submarines during the war. Very fortunately, as I said, it's only one way communication. So when the sub had to report back, he had to co uh, come up and use conventional RF, which was of great value to uh, the operators of the Enigma machines. Uh, now with amplifiers, all, all these can be basically classified into two groups. So back in the Spark day, there was no such thing as uh, a receiver with an amplifier or a transmitter with an amplifier. They didn't know how to make them and they weren't really thought of, I suppose. Uh, with amplifiers, there was a very interesting device developed by a, a, a Danish uh, engineer called Poulsen. And what this was, was it was something that the physics didn't explain at all at the time. And that is, it, it used the fourth state of matter. We're all familiar with uh, solid, liquid, and gas. But the Poulsen used uh, 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 plasma. This, this is atoms that are stripped, or molecules that are stripped down to ions. And uh, they had an enormous magnet. Here's, here's a megawatt federal arc. This is a plasma. It's called a plasma amplifier. And uh, I don't want to get into all the details, but you squirt in certain organic, uh, certain organic compounds like turpentine or alcohol into a big arc, uh, hundreds of amperes, and uh, you get uh, this uh, plasma forming. And the plasma has what's called negative resistance, that there's a certain sweet range where as you drop the voltage across the arc, the current increases and negative uh, a negative response like that is basically an amplifier. So they made a, a, an oscillator. And uh, you can appreciate that they, people got serious about this and they built these, uh, uh, the biggest ones were a megawatt, but, uh, and, and of course the efficiency was relatively low, but megawatt transmitters before amplifiers came along. Well, or modern amplifiers, I should say. Then of course, vacuum tubes, we all know the story there, starting the uh, Fleming with the diode in 1902 and DeForest with a triode in 1906. And uh, this is when radios familiar to us, of course, uh, uh, developed. Then semiconductors present to who knows when. 
and SDR is really a different a different beast too. So uh, essentially, amplifiers are characteristic in all modern radios, but they weren't present in the Titanic. Here she is. We've all seen pictures of her. Uh, this uh, somebody I'm sure has enhanced these, but this is this is her antennas here, and. Uh, uh, by today's, um, let's say, oil carriers and container ships, she's not that big, but she's pretty darn big for the time and pretty impressive. At 53,000 tons, 883 feet long, 92 foot beam. Uh, you see different numbers here because it depends on what uh, steam pressure you presume, but uh, uh, around 50,000 horsepower. And that was two of the old triple expansion steam engines with, interestingly enough, a Parsons turbine in the middle, a 17,000 horsepower turbine turned the, the central prop. And this was uh, a, a, a clever decision or a good decision because uh, uh, it ran, it generated those 17,000 horsepower from the steam, which was at too low a pressure to be used in the two triple expansion engines. So in other words, uh, the highest pressure steam went into the smallest of the triple expansion and the second, the third, and then into the Parsons. And it had, of course, 2,224 people on board and two radios, the main radio and uh, a backup. Now, let's have a quick look at her antenna. Uh, it actually was two twin T's, uh, as they would have said at the time. And uh, they were uh, impressive things. It was a symmetrical T, and the, le the length of the flat top was 450 feet. And that flat top was... Uh, 190 feet above the deck and 250 feet above the ocean. And then there was four down wires, which were 190 feet long. The back part here was just, this was just tarred rope. And I don't know what, I couldn't find what the insulators are made of, but it had uh, a long stretch of insulating material of some sort. And these are just uh, wood spars here to spread the thing out to the desired distance. They all tied together. So this was uh, uh, one big antenna, these two twin T's. And uh, if you worked out, I should say that, uh, of course, the, the four T's on top act as a quite an effective capacity hat, which uh, allows the antennas to resonate work efficiently well below their, the, 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 their natural resonant frequency if they didn't have all this, uh, all that metal underneath them. So the natural resonant frequency of this with the ship was about 930 kilohertz or 325 meters in the AM band. And this actually um, was uh, the uh, special short wave frequency that they could use if they wanted. And of course, the, the main frequency that was used was 500 kilohertz, i.e. 600 meters. So you take all this nice bronze wire together and you have a, an antenna, which is pretty close to a half mile. And uh, Interestingly enough, it also was a gain antenna uh, along the long axis of these 450 foot wires. So uh, it, it, it was actually worked out very well for the Titanic because uh, the most important communication was, was back to the UK as they departed and forward to North America when they got close enough. The, uh, the transmitter uh, couldn't reach uh, all the way across the Atlantic. It could go, well, we'll see in a moment how far it can go. But uh, so what you have on the Titanic is an enormous, very high antenna with no obstructions around, the perfect ground of a great disk of seawater as far as you care to, to look. Uh, and this was very important because without an amplifier, uh, what you are listening to when you listen to a signal in a transmitter like the Titanic had is the energy from the distant transmitter. Today, when you listen to your radio, you're listening to the energy from the power supply in your radio, local energy. And so if all your energy had to come from that distant transmitter, you'd better have a darn efficient antenna and a very efficient receiver, or there'll be nothing left that you can hear in your, your uh, headphones. Uh, here's a typical uh, starter transmitter, which most hams would have used back in 1912. Uh, and again, it's this is a uh, they would usually have a battery. You could have uh, AC used here, or you, you could develop a high DC voltage. But a simple system would essentially be uh, this. You close the key uh, that sets current running through. 
the, the, uh, this acts as a solenoid. It opens this little uh, set of points here, and that causes the current to stop. The field collapses, you, and the, the collapsing field induces a high voltage here. And this is the RF section. This is all low frequency over here. This is an old diagram for a capacitor, uh, an inductor, and a spark gap. And when the, when the energy enters this circuit and the, the spark sparks across the gap, you get a buzz of energy at the frequency determined by the capacitor, the inductor, and to a lesser extent by the antenna here. But uh, so uh, what you're sending out is a pulse like this that, that uh, basically damps very quickly to zero. And then this is uh, a second cycle of the uh, uh, points opening and closing like that. So you get one of these uh, with each uh, cycle here. This is what it would have looked like as a real setup, uh, usually an old automotive six volt battery. And this was likely to be, at least on, on my side of the pond, a Model T coil, because model, the Model T came out in 1909. So there's loads of them around in the time of the Titanic. And uh, 15 million were made and each Model T had four spark coils. So that's 60 million coils floating around. So that's what people tended to start with. Your capacitor, would be a stack of window panes with sheets of lead or zinc or copper uh, in between. And you adjusted the value of your capacitor by adding more or less uh, panes of glass and sheets of metal. Spark gap and uh, your output system. Uh, what they of often used was flat stock. That is, it, it was, might be an inch wide and you know, an eighth of an inch thick, something like that. And so the capacitor was built in. So this is a complete tuned circuit. And you could have uh, wooden dowels, and you could swing this closer together or further apart for, for uh, getting the coupling you wanted. So this is what uh, the, the Titanic transmitter was based on. This is a, a much more sophisticated, this is a uh, four radio coil, and this was used in the backup transmitter on the Titanic. So here you've got, uh, they, would, they would classify the coils by their length, because the length determined how many turns were in there. And so this would have a, a small primary, and here's the points down here, which with adjustments for them. And you'd have thousands of turns on this to the two sides of the spark gap. And you can see, and, and a gap like that was, was what you would get from a, a, a coil like this. So uh, much higher voltage than you'd get from an old Model T coil. But this was, uh, this was probably made in Chelmsford. And, and if you don't know, uh, Chelmsford is, is the, the English town that had the original Marconi factory in it, and they made the parts for uh, uh, their uh, land and uh, marine uh, tr transmitters and receivers and other equipment. Uh, okay, so uh, here's another picture of the old damped waves, as they call them. And uh, it's interesting to rem remember that at the time, yes, you sent Morse code, but it wasn't CW because it wasn't continuous wave. and if you think about it, here's a modern uh, carrier, which is, of course, very constant. And think about per unit of time, how much less energy this would have in it than this would have where the waves are not damped. So uh, these uh, the same power transmitter uh, producing damped waves would be much less effective on the air than what we use today, the continuous wave. Now, the Titanic, uh, the engineers who designed this, the Titanic's radio understood this, and they came up with a system, I'll explain at the moment, that this is basically what the, the Titanic produced. Uh, this, of course, was done on a modern scope, and it was done on a, uh, a replica of the Titanic's transmitter. Not, not that uh, it, the replica looked much like the original transmitter, but they tried to make it electrically very similar with a rotary spark device and so on. So here, um, yes, there's damping, but it's not, you've got a lot more power in your signal here than you would have up here. Um, here's another way to look at this whole thing, that a lot of the old spark sets, they, they would have a frequency of 60 or 120 hertz, especially if they used uh, uh, AC as the source, or if they used old buzzers and so forth, this would have been quite common. We all know what a 60 hertz tone or, or buzz sounds like. And, as a matter of fact, the old uh, doorbells, the old door buzzers that people had, at least over here, were really the same device. And uh, if you can imagine this on a, a noisy frequency, like uh, 500 uh, uh, kilohertz, uh, this blended in pretty well. So it was very hard to hear a did or a da uh, if it looked like this against a noisy background. 120, a little bit better, 
But if you get it up to 750 hertz, now this, of course, is, in fact, this is where CW ops like to uh, listen today is, is um, you know, a tone of five, six, 700 hertz. So this really stands out against the background. So aside from the extra energy, this is much easier for the human ear to distinguish. So th this uh, and, and the, the designers of the Titanic's machine understood this. So frequency increase, then you get a big improvement in signal tone, easier to copy and a, a decrease in dead air between the damped waves. You're getting more, pow you're getting more power into your signal. Uh, so um, people tried to improve this, get, fa get faster sparking. And uh, this is the first thing that, or one of the things that was com come up with, which became very popular, is uh, you take, you have your own alternator uh, and you drive it with a DC motor from a battery or some other DC source. And uh, you have a step up transformer and you get, this can be anything you want. In, in the Titanic, uh, this secondary was tapped. You could choose whether you wanted 10 kilovolts or 20 kilovolts uh, in, in your secondary circuit. And uh, what you have, instead of that old buzzer, uh, you have a, a second motor with, with a, a studded disc. And when the little, of course, here's your spark balls. And when the, disc, when the studs line up, a spark jumps across and you activate your secondary RF circuit. But... There is a problem. The original ones, of course, they had a sec separate motor for, for the rotating gap and for the drive motor. And the problem with that was that sometimes um, the, the, there was no timing with the, the peaks. This would produce, of course, a sine wave like this. And what you want is for the rotor, uh, rotary spark gap to uh, basically generate a spark or uh, align with the two spark balls at the peaks of the sine wave. But if it's not coordinated, sometimes you might, uh, it might, uh, they might uh, be in, aligned at the zero point, and then you get no spark at all. They might be halfway down and you get a weak spark. So uh, what needed to be done was that you needed to synchronize the phase of the AC being generated here with the position of the studs on the, on the, uh, the rotor. Uh, okay, I'm slight slight uh, uh, diversion here, just to say that uh, Marconi, of course, was uh, he was out to uh, uh, basically succeed in business as well as succeed in, in, in uh, making uh, effective radios, and so this is what was offered by the, the gang at Chelmsford in 1915. I couldn't find it for 1912, so I'm not 100 percent sure that all these versions of the Titanic's transmitter were available in 1912. I think they were, but I'm not sure. You could get an old style plain spark. That is, uh, most of the components would be exactly the same as the Titanic's, but uh, it only produced uh, a 70 Hertz or 140 Hertz spark note. Of course, you get two, two sparks with every cycle, the, the negative and the positive. Then there, was, then there was one called the Battleship. And this one had a very broad tuning range, but was really mostly used around 300 kilohertz because the Navy navies of the time uh, communicated down around 300 kilohertz, not 500, where most other people were. And it had a, a 560 hertz spark note, which was very nice. And there was a special, which is probably the version that was closest to what the Titanic had, but it had some key differences. And this was a rotary synchronous spark. Uh, 500 volt AC, which was uh, at 300 hertz. And uh, it had a, I'll have to explain this in a minute, but it it's synchronous uh, rotary discharger or uh, rotary spark uh, was in a can and it, and it produced a 600 hertz note. The Olympic, which was the sister ship of the Titanic was the first ship with exactly the radio the Titanic used uh, and built about a year before the Titanic. And uh, so in its case, uh, you had uh, uh, three, uh, a 300 volt, 420 Hertz alternator. And the spark rotary spark gap was in this big teak discharger box. And it, you've got an 840 Hertz spark note. Again, easy, something easy to copy in CW. And oh, the, the 600 here is this is its uh, 
this is when where it was always used as well in, in the short life of the Titanic was 600 meters or 500 kilohertz, if you like. But you could switch it. And certainly uh, the operators would would have tested this out uh, up in what they would call a short wave range or nine, uh, 930 kilohertz, 325 meters. But uh, that was never used as far as I know. Uh, they just use 600 meters, 500 kilohertz. And uh, what this is, we'll, we'll see in a moment, but the rotary spark gap, when I've, I've heard one running, there, there's an outfit called the Antique Wireless Association of, in upstate New York, and I was up at their museum, which if you're ever around uh, Rochester, New York, uh, and you like old radios, they have the most wonderful museum there, and they have a working rotary, synchronous rotary spark. And when you key down, when you're not, when you're, the key is up, it's perfectly quiet. It's just, it's the sound of a, a quiet electric motor just whirring away. But when the key goes down, uh, you've got these big, heavy, high voltage, high current sparks. Uh, uh, well, in, in this case, it would be 420 hertz, and it just roars. And uh, so I, I, I don't know for sure, but I believe that why they used a big teak discharger box was because the metal can would have been much louder. They put the whole uh, device, the whole power part of the transmitter in what they called the silent room. And it was a wood lined, the, the cabins were all steel uh, and they, they, they lined this one with wood. And then they also put the uh, discharger in this teak box. Uh, actually, if it had been just the teak box, it would have burned up. So it, it had a lead lining and an asbestos lining to keep it from uh, burning up. Okay, here's, here's the, uh, the system. So the main transmitter was uh, Marconi's five kilowatt synchronous rotary spark. Uh, they also made a 1.5 kilowatt version, in, but uh, yeah, for, for a bigger, uh, I think it was pretty expensive. I don't have a price to give you, but uh, anyway, smaller ships would have used the one and a half kilowatt. The, the Olympic and the Titanic used the five. And it was filled with devices uh, produced by excellent engineers. Actually, Ernest Rutherford was a, a Nobel laureate winning scientist, uh, a New Zealander, a Kiwi, who was at my old alma mater, uh, Mac, uh, McGill University in Montreal for a number of years. And then he went to Cambridge and he's developed all sorts of things to do with uh, radioactivity and uh, electrics. A chap, C.S. Franklin, who graduated from the Imperial College in London, who uh, initially, of course, people didn't understand resonance and tuning very well, but he came up with an excellent tuner called a triple tuner or multi-tuner, tuner, which was used not just in the Titanics and the Olympics uh, receiver, but really was used up to the end of the Spark era. People would buy it for any, any kind of receiver on a ship. And Reginald Fessenden uh, was a Canadian scientist uh, in, from Quebec, and he, a lot of people played around with the rotary spark gap, but he's generally given the credit for uh, first inventing it and developing it. And the radio in the Titanic was installed, aligned, tested uh, by uh, two of the Marconi operators, Jack Phillips, the, the senior, and Harold Bride, uh, the junior or assistant. And they were, uh, of course, did this at Harland and Wolf, the shipyard which, which built uh, Titanic. And so it was fully functional by 2nd of April. And there was a great rush because they, they, they were going to uh, uh, make the first trip across the Atlantic in, in just uh, uh, less than two weeks. It's rather interesting, too, that they took something which had never floated, popped it in the water. Its sea trials were about three to four days, and that was it. Uh, I, it surprised me because... Uh, most big ships take weeks to months of sea trials to test everything out. Call sign was MGY. Uh, every uh, British ship that had a radio had an M call sign, an M for uh, Marconi, of course. So the Titanic itself, one of the things that uh, it was supposed to be the most modern ship afloat. Uh, well, the, the Olympic was built from the same blueprint. And so there actually still were differences, but they were pretty close, uh, built from the same set of blueprints. Uh, anyway, it's electricity. They tried to run everything they could. So the system was, uh, the main system was plus and minus 100, 100 volts DC relative to the, the frame of the ship, the deck and, and the wall and floor of every, every room in the ship. Uh, plus and minus 100 volts DC at 16,000 amps. 
And they had a little emergency set up, uh, plus and minus 100 VDC at 600 amps. And uh, as far as is known, uh, actually, it's not really known if they ever got to the emergency power because this was all below decks and almost none of the crew down there uh, survived. The, uh, so the, the transmitter power in was uh, 100 to 110 volts. That was the kind of the normal fluctuation range, depending on what else was running on the ship, at 60 amps. And the power out, the RF power out of the transmitter, uh, they didn't measure it precisely. The, as we'll see in a moment, the uh, five kilowatt rating is the amount of uh, the AC power, the, the uh, uh, AC power which fed the up, uh, what you call it, step up transformer that that ran the uh, rotary arc, and the signal was a what they called musical, 840 hertz. And uh, when the Olympic went to to sea, uh, it was interesting. Back in those days, a, a, a good operator, a good marine operator, would know a lot about uh, the ship when he heard the signal that. Uh, Germans and the Japanese and the Italians and uh, and various other uh, groups had their own designs and every every transmitter sounded quite different in those days. Was it a, a, a synchronous spark and a non-synchronous spark, uh, a, a plane uh, uh, and anyway, lots of differences. So oh yeah, that's 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 a German one there and and uh, and this was absolutely unique. None of the others were musical, uh, having this high modulation frequency caused by the, the speed of the uh, rotary spark gap. And so the, the main receiver then was this Marconi multi-tuner uh, and, and the magnetic detector or a Fleming valve uh, for the tuner and detector. And uh, the magnetic detector was actually built by Ernest Rutherford. Uh, the, the ops called it the Maggie. Uh, and it was much more popular than the vacuum tube. Uh, so yeah, the, the Titanic went to sea with two operating vacuum tubes, and that was in the uh, 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 tuner detector, but uh, it wasn't as reliable as, as the Maggie. The, the Maggie, as we'll see, is a direct ancestor of the uh, uh, magnetic wire recorder for voice and, and so forth in the Second World War and of the magnetic tape uh, tape recorder that we're all familiar with. The auxiliary transmitter was was just the old plain uh, spark coil, like those early primitive uh, spark sets I showed. And uh, one advantage it had was that uh, if you didn't have uh, ship's power, or at least the emergency power, the main transmitter was dead, nothing you could do. But the auxiliary had a bank of batteries, and there's a charger which was running all the time the ship was operating. So. Uh, if, if all this stuff shut down, uh, you still had the bank of batteries and you could use this, this one here. But the guaranteed range, the guaranteed range uh, that Marconi gave for the five kilowatt was 250 miles. And the guaranteed range for the emergency was 40 miles. And it had what you have to fairly call a horrible receiver, something from about 1900. Uh, and uh, anyway, no tuning at all, uh, very insensitive. But actually, if somebody was within 40 miles of you, yeah, it might, it might work. Okay, and there's no one schematic of the whole, <coughs> the whole Titanic uh, transmitter, excuse me. And anyway, if there was, it would be too big to, to show it as, in a single picture. So here's a, here's a, a mostly accurate uh, uh, sort of the input part of the transmitter. So we have DC mains up here uh, and fuses and a clever little thing called a motor starter, which I'm going to discuss in a minute. Uh, and so what we have down here, and uh, there's a, uh, you can start it and then you adjust its speed and its power with a, a rheostat, which changes the current that's running through the fields of, uh, this is a DC motor running on 110, 100 volt, not volts. It's mechanically coupled to an alternator. And uh, here also, the DC mains will feed, uh, feed the fields through the field rheostat there. And this changes the amount of, of power that the alternator puts out. Uh, also, oh, I should say the field here is changing the speed. So this is where you get the speed. Uh, as a matter of fact, the instrument that the operator would use would be his ear. And he would uh, get this spinning 
at what uh, sounded like about the right frequency, which which worked out to 3150 RPM. And uh, so these are coupled together. The alternator puts out this uh, 300 uh, volts AC at 420 hertz. And it's just an ammeter and a voltmeter here to monitor the performance and a big knife switch to start it. And uh, then there's this interesting thing, a resonance coil. And what they did was this: you set this thing to 420 hertz and uh, this, you have a resonance circuit, which includes the this thing, the primary of the high voltage transformer and the windings of the alternator. And this allows you to set it so that this will cancel out all the reactants from all these inductors. So you just have a simple resistance when you're close to 420 hertz. So you can see that. You look at your ammeter here as you're fiddling with the speed of the motor here, and you'll see a point at which the amperes peak, and that's your minimum resistance through this. And then, then you're in the sweet spot. You're close to 420, and you you're, this is the most efficient. Now, here's your key. And uh, this could create some excitement if you use it like this, because what you are keying, and th this is your what, what the, the guy on the receiving end will hear, is uh, your uh, uh, 300 v volts AC at 420 hertz, hertz at 17 amperes. And uh, that's, that's a lot more than we usually have on our keys. Uh, so here's the step-up transformer, uh, and this is producing... It doesn't show it here, but there's actually the taps, and you can run it in series or parallel. In series, you get 20,000 volts from your for 300 volts here, 300 to 20,000, or if you run in parallel, 300 to 10,000 volts. And then here's your little spark discharger down here, which not shown here, but it's also linked. It's on the same. It's on a common shaft. Two choke coils. These let your 420 hertz through no problem, but they won't let 500 kilohertz through. So at this point, uh, you're preventing the RF output from getting back in here. Your RF output's over on this side. Uh, what's missing from this is just one thing missing, that there's actually two side-by-side -side panels like this, one for the, the, the motor and one for the alternator. And they're not showing the one. This was some other slightly different transmitter this was for. Uh, what I, I, I guess what I, I'd like to show here is, is some of the cleverness of the engineers and the fact that uh, uh, this may be a primitive device, but the people that designed it weren't stupid. They just uh, they didn't know all of the, the, the physics that we know today. And so what this was was starting uh, a big DC motor like this. Well, if you work it out, it was, prob it was probably either a 10 or a 15 horsepower motor because it took about 6.8 horsepower to develop the, the, the power that the alternator was putting out. So this was a big lever sat beside the operator. And that little end there was, was a handle big enough to fill your fist. And uh, when he was ready to start, they would close the, uh, the big knife switch. Then they would slowly pull this back. And so you're feeding the DC motor first, the 110 or 100 volt DC power uh, through all these resistors. So the, the current is, is low, but as you pull it back, you're shorting out the resistors, so back here, your engine is running. But this allows a slow start, which if you had an instantaneous start, uh, you would likely damage the motor with time or the alternator. When it's all the way back, there's a little electromagnet here, and there's this bit of soft iron, so it sticks. Uh, and uh, there's a spring down here, which if the electromagnet wasn't working, the uh, starter would snap off. And this... Uh, is basically uh, de dependent. The magnetic field here is dependent on the voltage. If the voltage gets too low in the feed from the ship for whatever reason, then this will release it and it snaps it off. So it's low voltage protecting. And of course, it's an instant response. Well, not instant, but fast response uh, protects the transmitter from low voltage. There's a second one down here, and I won't trace the wiring, but what this does is if your current gets too high, if the transmitter is drawing too much current, this will pull up this little steel plate here. This will make a short here, short out this electromagnet, and it'll snap back to off. So the thing has a, a rapid response to uh, unsafe levels of current and 
safe levels of voltage uh, uh, entering the transmitter. So, uh, uh, you know, it's old stuff, but they, they, they were thinking. Uh, here's, a, here's a better display. This is the whole main transmitter here, and it's really an elegant thing. Uh, these little here's the two matching uh, uh, panels, one for the starter motor, uh, drive motor, and one for the uh, alternator. And uh, uh, big, big uh, meters up at the top, big knife switches. Uh, there's fuses here, but there's also graphite anti-surge devices there. So sudden spikes can be uh, absorbed. They're basically a, a sort of a, a resistor. These two things are cute little electric lamps in, in shiny brass scallop shell shades, which look like they're just decorative. But they also, these, these lamps are also in the circuit. Uh, if I go back just for a minute. Uh, here, uh, they actually also act, act as surge suppressors. So I can see this, the, they're across the motor. And so if the motor kicks out some big sparks from its brushes or whatever, the, the bulbs tend to absorb them. Plus, of course, they uh, let you see the meters. Uh, the fancy starter, the fields, here's your uh, drive motor, uh, and here's your alternator. And on the end is this can which contains the rotary spark. The can was not used on the Titanic or the Olympic. This was on other ships. And uh, I think it was, as I said earlier, is basically a noise thing that this this would have been very loud. And they had all around the radio room on the on the uh, on the uh, boat deck, the top top deck on the ship, were the sleeping quarters for both passengers and uh, ship's officers. And uh, I'm sure they wouldn't have wanted that roar in Morse code uh, going all night. Uh, okay, take a follower. Here's that resonance adjustment again, which gives you a, a very efficient uh, uh, circuit for the output of the alternator. Uh, and here's actually what they really used in the Titanic and, and, and other ships afterwards. Uh, they called it a magnetic uh, key, uh, but it's really a relay. So the key then only switched the windings of the relay, not, not in the full 300 volts at 17 amps was was switched by a relay a little a little further from the operator's knuckles. Now here's the here's the guts of the transmitter. Uh, here's our high voltage transformer again, uh, set to either 10 or 20 kV. RF chokes to keep the RF from getting back into the transformer, but allowing the the uh, 420 uh, hertz AC through. Here, here's again our rotary. Uh, uh, spark discharger, and you can see it's it's lined up as it should be because it's on the common shaft. It spins around, it's got 16 studs, and this is the tank circuit here. This is a, a big coil called a spiral inductance. This is four heavy galvanized tubs full of uh, sheets of glass and sheets of uh, zinc, which are the capacitors. There's a thing in the middle called uh, a Swiss, um, uh, what do you call it there? Uh, Oh, senior moment, Swiss commutator. Uh, and well, all it does is it's got a bunch of uh, copper pegs and you, you definitely don't use this when the machine is running. But by moving the pattern of pegs around, you can hook these up as all in series or all in parallel or series parallel. You would only do that if you were switching from the main frequency, 500 kilohertz to the short wave frequency, quote unquote, at uh, 930 kilohertz. The jigger was... Uh, this is, this is two coils. Okay, let's say in, in the way we'd think of it today, there's two parts to the tank coil. There's the spiral inductance, which has a big knob on the top and it's accessible. So it, you can do your coarse tuning there. And in here are two coils. The, uh, the, the one that's connected to the tank is in the back and you can't really see it, but there's a little crank there and a threaded shaft. And so the top, the front coil can move up or down. The tank coil behind it stays where it is in the bottom. So this is, um, it's like what they would call the goniometer back in the day, but it's not a true goniometer. You just, the two coils, when they're lined up, have maximum coupling, maximum power transfer, and uh, a certain impedance. As you crank the whole face up here and the top, top coil moves, you get less and less coupling and a change in the impedance. The little dots are studs, uh, taps on the coil. So when you're setting it up, you find the correct tap to get maximum energy out and you, you crank your little handle there to get the right coupling between the back tank coil and the front pickup coil 
uh, which links to here is the antenna. It's called a Bradfield uh, a special insulator because, of course, the outside would be splashed with salt water and they had to avoid loss of power. So they, they came up with quite an elaborate uh, through hole, if you like. And a couple of series uh, coils. And this would have been something that you would have set up uh, in uh, Belfast, probably. And, and once you knew the, the right taps for your ship and your antenna, and those two bands, uh, 500 and 930, you would have noted them down and then you would have had to move these wires around to them when the time came. The grounding, the grounding side of the RF went through two little devices I'll describe in a moment called earth arresters. And uh, uh, it, it, basically they acted as relays, but they're simpler and I think more clever. Uh, and when they when you're not in transmit you automatically drop into receive instantaneously and then this goes off to your receiver and this is ground down here and here is how uh, in setting up any transmitter what you need to know is uh, what's the output i mean you, you want to be able to and i'm sure many of you did what i did when i started in ham radio and uh, use an old light bulb and i remember starting with a a, a command set transmitter something used in world war ii planes and uh, you just hook up a light bulb and you, you diddle and fiddle with the controls to get the brightest light. And that's exactly what this was. A little bulb looks like a, 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 a brake light bulb in a car. And there's a shunt behind it. And you have to set it so that uh, it won't quite burn out when you have maximum current through it. But you can see a dim glow at a, at a low current. And you just adjusted all these different things to give you maximum uh, key down brightness in that little bulb. Uh, don't need to go into this anymore. This is this is just showing the tank part of the circuit, uh, perhaps a little bit better than the, the, the other one there. The, the red is, is basically the RF. And uh, here you can actually see the coupling crank a little bit better along the side there. And uh, 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 two taps in the high voltage transformer. And again, your your uh, uh, spark disk here. Here's what, uh, this is a uh, CGI computer graphics image, but uh, we know that it's accurate because there's lots of pictures of this. The pic This is much clearer than most of the pictures that survived from the time, but there's enough descriptions of the pictures and the uh, discharger, excuse me, the, uh, the this setup is clearly seen in, in robot photos from the the real Titanic on the bottom, 12,000 feet down. And uh, so again, the, the, the drive motor, the uh, alternator, and uh, the disc is, uh, we're looking at side view of the disc. The disc is running through this. This box is like a, a foot by two feet. It's a good big box. This is the teak box. Uh, and this little knob down here and the parallel one over here, these are how you adjust the spark gap. The disc in the middle has, has uh, studs going through it. So when you make uh, the contact, you're actually making two sparks, not one, one on each side going to the uh, the uh, outer contacts here. Those what look like pipes are metal shielded wire, which is going to the two sides, which are going to be 10 or 20,000 volts DC different. Uh, so anyway, you need, you need good insulation. So here's, uh, here's another CGI picture. This Park Stevenson was, uh, uh, is, I guess, a, a friend of James Cameron who did the Titanic movie. And, and uh, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's another one of these fellows that's, that's done all sorts of things and is competent in a lot of areas. But anyway, so they, he took pictures from the, the Titanic and converted the CGI. Uh, picture is pretty accurate, but he doesn't have the, the lead and the, and the asbestos linings here. You can actually see them here. This is the real Titanic, uh, uh, somewhat the worse for wear. And you can actually, if you look in there, you can see a little line that's either the asbestos or the lead uh, in, the, in the lid. And you can see here's, here's the, uh, the, the eye, eye hooks to raise the assembly here. And uh, incidentally, in here, you see how they've left the, the snout of the alternator sort of wide open and uh, you can reach in and you can move the uh, brushes back and forth. And, and the reason for that is that's how you synchronize the uh, actual meeting of the uh, studs 
with the uh, the cycles, the AC cycles that are being produced. So this is how you optimize the thing. And you just move it back and forth. And where you get the brightest arc and the loudest noise, you know you're, you're right on the, the plus and minus peaks of the AC, which becomes uh, the RF. This is... Uh, uh, something that doesn't look anything like the Titanic one, but this this was used, uh, well, it simulates, and this, this is for synchronous uh, spark. Um, and you can see the uh, uh, the, the, the uh, contacts themselves are, well, they're not contacts, the, the, the uh, tips of the spark gap are tungsten. They're actually tungsten and thorium. And again, I think that this was Ernest Rutherford's uh, smart idea, that thorium, of course, is a radioactive element. And the radioactive element causes air around itself to ionize a bit, become a bit more conductive to electricity. So by ionizing the air, when uh, the gap approaches, uh, you, you will have a longer and a stronger spark. In other words, the spark will start sooner because the air is easier to ionize and it'll last longer. So I think that the tungsten and thorium is simply to make the spark better. Anything makes a spark better where you get more current and more uh, longevity is going to give you a better signal. This is the one and only picture that we know of that uh, of the Titanic, uh, Titanic's radio room. And it was taken by uh, a pastor who, uh, the last place that the Titanic stopped, it actually, it went to Southampton, then it went across to Cherbourg, France, to pick up a few passengers. And then it stopped in, in Queens, uh, Queenstown, Ireland, to let a few people off. And this was by uh, a passenger getting off there. Uh, some smart move. Actually, <laughs> there was a whole story to it that he was, he was a, a pastor, a parson, and uh, he uh, really wanted to take, go across on the Titanic just, just to do it. I guess he must have had a few extra pounds in his pocket. So uh, he got on, paid his, paid his passage, and his, uh, uh, his bishop found out about it and uh, gave him hell, I guess. And so he regretfully got off in Queenstown. But uh, I suspect the regret did last beyond the 15th of, of April. But this is all we knew about it. And this is all that James Cameron knew when he did the movie. And you can see it's a double exposure to uh, there undoubtedly were many more pictures taken, but they all went down with the Titanic because radio was a great novelty and the idea that you could radio back and uh, remind the butler to feed the cat or whatever you needed uh, was uh, something that a lot of people did on the way across the Atlantic. This is the uh, radio room in the Olympic uh, launched a year earlier. And so this is what uh, uh, Cameron thought that the, he said, ah, oh, same radio, the, the ship was built off the same uh, blueprint, the radio room's going to be the same. But there's a couple things. One, you see this dark square here. The radio room on the Olympic was on one side of the boat deck, and that was a window. And, and they, I guess they made it that way so that uh, they wouldn't have to look at people peering in as they were operating. Uh, but on the Titanic, it was in, uh, along the center line of the boat. On uh, So it was just 12, 14 feet over from this, but it meant that they had no window, but they had a skylight above. And as we shall see, they did not have the same setup as the Titanic. Here you can see the charger for the backup radio, the two panels for the alternator and the drive motor with, with the uh, big off on knife switches and of course the meter, mo meter monitoring. Uh, I've heard people call it Stone Age radio. And in this case, it kind of fits. The, the frames for these panels are cast iron, and that surface there is slate. Uh, so yeah, it, it was kind of stone. Uh, and down here are the, the two fields and that big starter in the middle. Here's from the movie, and the movie pretty well gave you just what was in the, the Olympic. Oh, uh, no, I'll, I'll show it in another one. Uh, this is just to give you a, a feel. Uh, this is this is also uh, a computer graphics image because there's no way that this picture could actually be uh, taken. Well, you, yeah, of course, at 12,000 feet down in the ocean, there is zero light, so it's inky blackness. And, and uh, uh, anyway, the, the the submarine here, the Alvin, is uh, uh, very real. It's it's been working out of Woods Hole, Massachusetts, since uh, the 1960s. Uh, I, I went down and admired it a few times. 
what they did, it's sitting right on top of the radio room. The skylight uh, uh, that gave the operators uh, daytime light inside is, is right under it. And uh, it's got down here, it's got a little robot on an umbilicus. And the robot would have gone in here to see the, the uh, remains of the uh, radio installation. Here's, uh, here's the silent room, that uh, wood-lined room, which was supposed to quiet down the roar of the spark. And again, you can see the drive motor, the alternator with its long snout, the open uh, teak box, and the, the disc is, is in there. Uh, but uh, look what's up here. Here's the four meters. Uh, here are the field uh, rheostat settings. And uh, you can't see it, but the knife switch is actually opened here. And it's, it's sort of a silent testament that uh, when Jack Phillips, the lead operator, finally got off the radio and when water was literally washing around his feet, he went in and he pulled the knife switch because that's standard operating procedure. When you were finished with a radio, you pulled the main knife switch down. Although he knew as well as anybody else, better than most, that the ship was on its way to the bottom and it would never be used again. But he took the time to reach around the corner. So this was set up differently. All the controls here were put in the silent room and not in the uh, uh, main operating room. So uh, uh, Cameron got it wrong. Over here is the Swiss commutator. Here is uh, some of those big boxes for the capacitors. Don't know what don't know what that is going across. Here is what it probably looked like again CGI with the the big operating desk, uh, the the starter here. There you can see the handle which uh, you would have, sitting there as an operator, you'd reach and slowly pull that back and that would start up your, your drive motor. And up here would be, uh, these are what are called magnetas. Uh, you might think that they're clocks, but they're not. There was only, only two clocks on the ship and they were both on the bridge. One for either London time or New York time, whichever they were closer to, and the other for uh, the ship's time. And this was before time zones. So the ship's time was derived from the sightings taken every day at noon by one of the ship's officers with his sextant, and that was ship's time. So if you ever try to work out the exact sequence of when all these different ships were calling the Titanic and calling shore, the time becomes a bear because every ship was on different time, unless it was exactly uh, in, uh, in the same longitude as the uh, uh, Titanic. These big brass things here, these are pneumatic uh, delivery tubes. Uh, I don't know if they're common in England. I, I imagine they are or were common. Over here, department stores and the like, hardware stores, would, when you went to pay your bill, when you picked up your, your goods, uh, they had little tubes there and there was a, a low vacuum in here. They'd, they'd put the, uh, the bill in the low tube with, along with your money. It would boop, off it would go. It would go to an office somewhere where they would make change and send you back the receipt. And here, uh, for all, and, and hundreds of passengers sent messages over this equipment before the Titanic sank. And what you did, you went to the, the chief purser's office and uh, you filled it out and you, you paid your pounds. It was pretty expensive, but uh, a lot of the people on Titanic weren't worried about a few pounds. Uh, and uh, just to give you a quick run about the layout here, this is the triple tuner, which we'll see in a moment. This Actually, it's really, a, it was an excellent device developed in 1907 and really, uh, actually, I at one point I would really love to have had one. I'd like to test it to see just how it performed. And I did find one for sale, but they wanted uh, $50,000 and I, that seemed a, a bit rich for me. So I don't have one. Um, this is the, the Maggie or magnetic detector. And I'll just describe it in a minute. Uh, yeah, the start, the charging, but all the other motor controls are on the other side of the wall. So Cameron got it wrong in the movie. Oh, here's another thing. That's, there's a telephone there. And, uh, and this, this thing up here is probably the uh, 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 frequency meter. Actually, it's, it's a wavelength meter, which they could get an approximate idea of what wavelength they were on. This is a telephone, but it goes to the chief purser. Uh, there is no direct communications between the radio room and either the captain's cabin or the bridge. Now, that that's certainly something that uh, was changed by the ITU after this happened. But uh, 
uh, all the things they did right, but they didn't have any direct communication between the captain and the radio room or the, or the bridge. So when the ship, Titanic was sinking, the assistant operator, Harold Bride, who spent most of the two hours running back and forth with messages for the captain that the Carpathia was approaching or that some other ship was also trying or whatever. Uh, so uh, here's another picture by the robot of this. This is the... Uh, this would be the drive motor voltage. Uh, you, could, you can see the VOLTS in there. And this, of course, is in the uh, uh, silent room. Now, the light is where the operating room with that big table we were just seeing was. Oops, excuse me. Push the wrong button here. Come on. There we go. Uh, and the light is here because they put a light over there deliberately. But sadly, what happened there was apparently at the time of the sinking, Below and behind the operating room, there was a huge bubble of air. And that huge bubble of air was in, if you saw the movie Titanic, it's where uh, uh, there was the, the final kiss on board at the top of the, the grand staircase. And the grand staircase apparently had held a great bubble, but the radio room above it filled up with water and sort of guesstimating its dimensions and, and so forth, it would have uh, picked up about 64 tons of water. And anyway, the back wall and the floor blew out. So all that nice old antique radio equipment went tumbling and crashing down the grand staircase. Uh, hang on, what's going on here? Oh, there we go. Try that. That's still not good. What's, what is happening here? I think you may need to click on the side, Fred, actually. Uh, One of the side so pictures. Over, over here, yeah. On the okay, left, sir. on your left. Yeah. Okay, I'll just have to wind them up a bit. There we go. Okay, here's um, here's the uh, the field uh, field rheostat in the silent room uh, for the uh, uh, drive motor, and uh, it's interesting because apparently a normal position for it would be over here. So almost certainly Harold Bride, the assistant who was doing everything he could for Jack Phillips, the operator, uh, uh, the voltage began to falter uh, a little while before the ship actually went on. The, actually, everything came, was running for a long time. The, the lights were on until almost the last few minutes of, of the Titanic's uh, life on the surface. But uh, apparently the voltage began to drop. So this is what you would do if uh, the voltage began to drop, then the motor would weaken. And uh, at some point, the, uh, it, the the motor would have dropped out because of that fancy switch. Uh, anyway, uh, so they had to w wind up the fields to keep the thing going. So it's kind of sad sitting there thinking that, you know, we're, we're seeing directly uh, something not touched by human hands since 1912, and which was done to keep the transmitter transmitting in this dire emergency. Uh, here again, the CGI to the rescue. This is a, a look at what we, uh, the uh, the whole room has been photographed all the way around, of course, by the robot. So we know where everything was now. And here's the spiral inductance. So it's very convenient. You Between the commutator uh, to change the arrangement of the capacitors and the spiral inductance, you control the operating frequency of the transmitter. And here's your uh, contr controls for the, the motor and, and the alternator. And here's Here's reality today. Uh, it's all the uh, the walls have completely dissolved away. It's not just saltwater corrosion, but uh, there are the great depths that there are bacteria which gain their living by turning iron into iron oxides, and uh, they make what they call rusticles. And if you see the outside of the, the Titanic, there'll be these great brown icicles, if you like, hanging down. And and these th these are full of bacteria which are uh, basically having uh, uh, the Titanic for their meals. But anyway, here's uh, the remainders. There's the spiral inductance, and you can even see the green from the, the, the heavy copper windings, which are which are in it. And uh, here's the, the tubs of the capacitors underneath it. And this is, uh, uh, I, I, I no, it's, it's not, not the panels. So it, it, it must, anyway, the wall and some of that stuff up there. All this is standing when the wall is gone because um, the bacteria don't uh, degrade the copper. The copper is toxic to them in that in, in high concentrations. So the, 
the, the equipment's all standing on its wires, or, or some of it's standing, some of it's fallen. Another shot, just to give you a clearer idea, and here's our nice big teak box, and, and this is how it would have all would have looked. The jigger, as they called it, um, and the spiral inductance, the Swiss commutator, and the capacitors. Here's a, another shot, which shows you even more things. Uh, the CGI is nice, because uh, in my last couple of presentations, I didn't put it in so much, but it, it gives you a feel of what they would have been working. And so here's the whole silent room lined with wood and uh, uh, buckets here in case of fire. You obviously wouldn't want to throw salt water on the 10 to 20 kilovolt transformer. Uh, and uh, how things were set up. I, this here, I'm not sure. I think it was just a cabinet of some sort, but uh, the, the accumulators, as they called them, the batteries, for the backup transmitter, which was never used because the main transmitter worked right till the ship was going under, the high voltage transformer, the little resonating coil, uh, capacitors, Swiss uh, commutator. Uh, over here is the little bulb to show the output of the RF, spiral inductance, and, and so forth. And they also had duct boards down here uh, because teak is uh, one of its desirable properties is that if you come in with wet shoes, shoes wet with salt water, uh, it's not slippery. And uh, a lot of battleships use uh, teak, teak or mahogany for their decks. As a matter of fact, some years ago, I was on the Missouri, the ship on which the uh, surrender of Japan was signed. And it, it's all either teak or mahogany, I think teak. Uh, now, here, here's one that some of you out there uh, have an idea. This is uh, uh, shot from the silent room. And it looks like some car's front suspension, but it's not. What do you suppose this great spring is doing in the radio room? No idea. Anybody? If you're asking Anybody? Me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that's all right. It's just, uh, uh, once I say it, you'll, you'll see why it's useful. It's one of four. Uh, and what it's doing is it, well, it, it was suspending the operating table because any solid surface you would put your hand on on the ship had the deep vibration of those three enormous motors going at the back. And if you're trying to send Morse and you're trying to fill out uh, uh, Marconi grams, uh, it's nice to have a steady surface, not one that's buzzing and vibrating. So this kept the operating surface uh, uh, smooth and quiet. Okay, now here's a, I like gadgets and this, this was, they were smart about this. This is uh, what's called an earth arrester. And it's, it does the job of a relay, but in a perhaps a, a slightly better way. The outer disk, you can see a countersunk hole there, uh, is just bolted to the, the, the wall of the ship, the steel wall. So this, this is ground. The, 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 the big disk is ground. There's a smaller disk in here. Now, uh, between the smaller disk and this is a, a sheet of mica under that small one, uh, one one hundredth of an inch thick. And it doesn't extend quite to the edges. There's a, about a quarter inch circle outside where there's just an air gap of 0 0.01 inches between the inner disc and the outer disc. The outer disc is grounded, the inner disc is not. Uh, when you are, okay, and then here's a, here's a transmitters here, and here's the jigger uh, coupled to the antenna through that, that winding in the jigger. Uh, when you go to transmit, a hundredth of an inch is not gonna stop the high voltage from the transmitter. So it jumps across and you have a perfectly uh, reliable, effective ground for the transmitter. And uh, the minute you lift the key, that sp spark goes away and it's open. And a hundredth of an inch is just fine for the receiver. Well, if you had nearby uh, lightning strikes or, or a lot of lightning or whatever, it would jump across, but that would only be a pop in the receiver and it would protect the inductors in the receiver, which are all wound with fine wire. So it's... Uh, an instantaneous. Also, it makes the uh, uh, transmitter uh, what hams call QSK, meaning the instant you lift the key, you're back and receive. And so it can be quite handy, especially if you're an experienced operator, that you're working one ship and uh, you lift the key and you hear somebody else trying to call you. Well, you can hear it if you have QSK and if you just have uh, uh, 
the sort of thing most of us use where there's uh, uh, you stay and receive till you actually switch to transmit and vice versa. So uh, this is uh, this is how they went from transmit to receive. Uh, no moving parts uh, works just fine. Uh, I actually went and I looked up, I looked some stuff up. And so a hundredth of an inch arc over takes 760 volts. If it's everything, if the air is dry and the, the uh, device is dry, but uh, that's the, the RF coming out would have voltage is much higher than that. So, and once you, you establish the arc, uh, it uh, takes much lower voltage to maintain the arc because the, the air is uh, air molecules are ionized. Under human conditions, somewhere in the two to four hundred volt range, and so uh, anyway, that's 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 how they did it. Now here's a key that uh, if you have one, don't throw it away. They're they're pretty pretty unique. It's it's a, it's actually three keys in one, and uh, you can see it from different angles. Here's one key, here's a second key, and here is there's just a little bar that goes under the, uh, the, the disc of the, of the main key, which closes this. So when you close this, you're also closing this uh, third key. So why do you need all this? Well, the key was designed with that uh, key and current of uh, 17 amps at 300 volts in mind. And so the contacts there uh, it wasn't unusual that, especially if you're sending a long message, those little contacts have gotten very, very hot. And uh, sometimes they'd weld together. And once they welded together, you, of course, were shorting out the uh, uh, whole transmitter. And it was uh, things like the, the uh, spinning uh, uh, spark disk uh, would get extremely hot very quickly. And uh, the windings in the alternator and in the motor and in the high voltage transformer would start heating right up too. So uh, uh, if nothing was done, you'd destroy your transmitter in a few minutes. So what you did was this you see is in series. So you yank up the long one, the long key here, that's a guillotine key, they, the, the, the ops called it. You pull that up and you've disconnected this from the circuit. So you've, you've saved the transmitter and there's two of these keys side by side and so then you'd have to transfer the wires over to the other key, but that's better than burning up your transmitter. And uh, so this little key here, uh, we'll get to that. No, we won't get to that. I'm going to go back for that. These are those auxiliary contacts here. So what it does is when you key down, it shorts out your headphones. And uh, so uh, <laughs> you can imagine if... Um, how loud the receiver would be if you were listening to your own transmitter, five kilowatt transmitter, uh, with no automatic gain control or no noise clipper or noise blanker or anything like that. You get you get the whole business in your ears. So uh, the minute the key goes down, the auxiliary contacts short out the headphones. Again, to me, it's uh, there's a lot of cleverness in this thing. I mean. Okay, some of the other gadgets. This is the little tuning lamp, which I mentioned before. And this is just a shunt resistor. I mean, it kind of looks like an inductor, but it's a resistor. And so your RF would go in one terminal, out the other. And uh, you, the resistor was put in series with a little filament in the bulb to find the setting where you couldn't burn the bulb out, but you had enough light to, to see changes. And here's the magnetic key relay, just we'd call it a relay today to take the load so that you didn't have to worry about uh, your, your um, contacts uh, melting. This this had considerably heavier contacts than the one on the, on the normal key. And here's on the Olympic, you can actually see there's an earth arrestor down there. And here's the little RF current device, if you like, current measurer up here. Uh, and here's this tuner. So uh, we're into the receiver of the, of the uh, thing now. And it's it's a magic thing. Uh, it it's uh, people knew the the four sevens. Uh, if you just said, "Oh, I've got a four sevens tuner," they knew what you had. And it was the C.S. Franklin, a young fellow, um, hired by Marconi, and uh, he developed this. Each of these is uh, a standard air variable cap. It would look pretty familiar, but they isolated by putting them in these these brass canisters. And the knobs on top have a fine verniers here, so they're very resettable. 
tiny spark gap to protect what's inside. Uh, this tap the coil, this is the antenna matching coil here. And so you could get the best match, which you just by the loudest sound. And uh, this is a four position switch, which uh, switches in this thing would uh, tune from 120 kilohertz to 3.7 megs, or as they would have said, 2600 to 80 meters. Uh, and so it was basically a four band uh, triple tuned circuit. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, it enabled you to make best use of the signal you had. If, uh, if a, a ship was close to you and you had a strong signal, then you could make it very selective and cut out most of the noise and have really quite a nice quality signal. Or if the ship was far away, you'd have to sacrifice some of that and uh, tune this thing on the end here. With, this just gave you the band. There was four bands in this great range. This knob on the end uh, basically gave you the degree of coupling. And a low degree of coupling would be selective and uh, high signal loss. And uh, uh, the other way, uh, tight coupling would give you more signal, but uh, less selectivity. And this this is uh, what the guts look like. Actually, this is these are goniometers here, which which couple and uncouple by changing the uh, relationship between the two windings. This one is slipped off. It's that's that's it shouldn't be that way. Um, okay, I won't take time to go through it, but just to let you know that here's the the schematic of this thing, and you can see there's four sections down here, and it tells you just which way to set it for each of the 80 to 150 meters, 150 to 600, 1600 to 2000, 2000 to 2600. So you could, this is a broadband tuner, you'd set it where you wanted. And uh, the magnetic detector uh, went in here and it detected whatever came out of the tuner. And these are those balls with the wire on them. By changing the orientation of the wire by turning the, the shaft, uh, you get more or less coupling, more or less selectivity. Here's what it looked like. Um, and uh, I, I actually, I'm not going to go through the, uh, basically you had two bias magnets, which is what tape recorders have, of course, or an electromagnet. And uh, you put a, a silk covered, I think it was seven strand soft iron wire, which is easily magnetized. It went through this little double coil here. The big one here went to two uh, terminals for headphones. The other two went to the output of the tuner. And uh, it uh, it was developed by, uh, uh, what's his name? Okay, Ernest Rutherford. Uh, I won't go through it all, but in uh, the Magnus put a pre-bias on the thing uh, so that the wire was slightly magnetized. And then when you put a signal on there, the signal going in one direction would increase the magnetism and then the other direction would cancel the magnetism, bringing it back to zero. So uh, you basically then had a recording of the signal, which was picked up by the center coil, uh, which you could hear. And it was uh, it was very sensitive and, and very, uh, very reliable. The box itself, the big brown box, is just a clockwork mechanism in there. And so there's a key, key on the end that winds it up. And then there's another little knob, which, uh, you had to pull out to operate it. And then actually very much like the old gramophones of the time. And uh, to stop the thing, you put it back in. And so you'd, you'd keep all the, the, the tension that was in the spring at the time you stopped it. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually, maybe I'll just put one story in that the third officer of the Californian, which was 11 miles away and stopped when the, the Titanic sank, uh, was kind of interested in, in radio and he used to go down and listen to the operator operate. Uh, the operator had been sent to bed because he'd been working for about 16 hours and the captain uh, saw the Titanic, but because of a cold water mirage, he didn't realize, he, he said, that's not the right sh shape for the Titanic. I don't know what it is. And the Titanic sent up rockets. And he said, well, that's, it's some kind of passenger ship and they're having a party on board. Uh, it wasn't, they were sending up the rockets because they were in desperate straits, but, he didn't get the uh, operator back out of bed to go down and listen on the radio. But the third officer went down there and he kind of wanted to listen. So he, he put the headphones on and nothing was happening. And he didn't know how to operate the Maggie. If he had understood that, why, well, if I just pull this lever on the side, uh, 
it's going to start turning and I'm going to start hearing. And he didn't know to do that. But if he had done that, uh, things might have turned out very differently. Actually, Captain Lord of the uh, Californian, the captain in that case, wasn't uh, officially punished for anything. But apparently the fact that he hadn't bothered to do anything about an unknown ship 11 miles away sending up rockets uh, sort of uh, blighted his career and he never got a good command again. This was the, the alternative, which people didn't like. Here's the a Marconi Fleming valve receiver. And here's two Fleming valves. It only needed one, this little knife switch. They were very unreliable. This was the main problem with them. Uh, nothing wrong with the principle, but uh, uh, they'd burn out. Of, you'd look at them sideways and they'd burn out. So that the thing was designed with two of them. So if one burned out, you flip this little knife switch here over to the other position. And it has two tuned circuits as opposed to the three of the triple tuner. And these were rheostats to adjust the filament voltage on the two tubes and a coupling knob over there, never used. What people did, a lot of people did was this. Uh, these were VT tubes. Uh, the, uh, they were made by, uh, what was the company? It's a US company. Uh, and these were much more reliable. These were uh, early diodes. VT tubes were, the VT was a, a series for the US Army. And uh, they were made by, uh, anyway, a good dedicated company for making specialty things like vacuum tubes were at the time. And uh, anyway, so these were much more reliable. But anyway, they weren't available at the time that the Titanic went down. And here you can see the condensers and the, the vernier they had on top. So they could, they could have presets. Uh, and, uh, be, you know, really most of these uh, uh, radios were set on one frequency and never deviated. So you just, you just took down notes about all the correct settings and you only had to go through the tuning once. Uh, here's another little thing I found that uh, we all know how useful it is if you're checking out a receiver to have some kind of signal to listen to, right? So here is the earth arrestor. This is the stuff we've seen before. Here's the key and the relay. Uh, and here's the earth arrestor. And before this, you have the takeoff to, and here's the Marconi multiple tuner with the Maggie uh, and the headphones the headphone shorting circuit and a, a phone condenser, which was really kind of a, a tone control. You could use different positions and get uh, more and more muffling of the high frequencies, use whatever was most intelligible. But over here, you see another key and a little doofinkus in here, which is actually, uh, it's a buzzer. And uh, it produces a tiny spark, just, I think, just like the sort of buzzers that people used to have in their, their homes or their apartments. You come up to the door and you push and you hear a zzz, and the person knows that there's someone outside. Uh, and so it just sits here and it's not actually connected to the tuner, but it's right near the input. So and you have a little key here and a dry cell. And so if you wanted to check to make sure that the Maggie was working and the multiple tuner was working and your headphones were working, you could just push this little key this would buzz and you'd hear the buzz in the headphones. So this was a, a, a receiver headphone detector tester, which they stuck right in there. And uh, okay, here's a, here's a picture of, again, CGI, of course, of, of the whole setup or a different part of it. This hole in the ceiling or, or inset, this is where the antenna wire went through to the the Bradfield uh, uh, insulator, and then up to the enormous antenna above. Uh, looking through here, the second room, of course, is the operating room. The third is the bunk room where the two of them slept. And I think that's just a, it's not a door, it's just an armoire, and they kept their uniform, uniforms in there. And again, motor, alternator. Uh, over here is the transformer, uh, high voltage transformer, the, the teak uh, deck uh, boards. And here, is the uh, little RF lamp um, brilliantly lit, showing that you're actually transmitting. Uh, now, now there's something wrong. I won't play the guessing game again, but there's something wrong with this picture. That uh, it's pretty silly, actually. They're showing. Look at that knife switch. That, now that was actually thrown, as I mentioned, uh, by it had to be Jack Phillips as he was leaving. Uh, but here they're showing the thing working. You get the glow from the arc. You see the RF uh, current meter working, 
uh, it wouldn't work if you turned off the drive motor. Anyway, uh, other than that, it, it's as good a picture as we're likely to get of, of what, what the system looks like. Uh, I guess we don't need that. I don't know why I put that in too. Okay, so how did the system perform? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Marconi guaranteed a 250 mile daytime range. And they made several hundred contacts, so they do. Well, the first thing on the sea trials, I think it was on the third or the night of the third or the fourth, uh, they uh, uh, contacted Tenerife in the Canary Islands in Port Said uh, on the Suez Canal at 1,900, 2,600 miles. I think we often think of a increased distance and skip and so forth as, as being something that comes with nighttime or a solar maxima. But uh, in fact, the delay layer goes away and even lower frequencies in the MF and LF region, uh, they really improve. So uh, very substantial. And again, when you're hearing Port Said or when they heard Port Said, they were hearing energy produced in the transmitter at Port Said, not something supplied in their receiver. Uh, and they found that during the day, that 400 mile range, anything within 400 miles, I could copy quite well. And they sent hundreds of messages. And actually another thing which uh, was unf very unfortunate was on the 13th of April, they had a failure of the transmitter. And uh, long story short, uh, there was a 14 kilovolt uh, rubber covered wire. Uh, it, so they were probably running the 20 kV tap and and the current drawn by the tank was pulling it down to 14. Anyway, that's that's my guess, but uh, they had the choice of a nominal 10 or a nominal 20 and the nominal 10 wouldn't give you 14 kV. Um, but uh, it stopped work. Anyway, the the, uh, the big uh, uh, starter would jump, you know, they, they'd set it and the, the motor would start and then boom, it would jump off. And long story short, it was this wire, but the wire wasn't out where they could see it. It was actually inside the high voltage transformer. And now the high voltage transformer was actually a transformer submerged in oil in that big galvanized can, which makes good sense. I mean, high voltage is like that at sea with humid air and salt everywhere. Uh, submerging the whole business in, in oil is a great idea. But the, the, the short was somewhere down there in the oil. So uh, it, was, uh, it took the, the two operators all night to find just where the problem was and to fix it. And actually, it's, it's darn lucky they did. Actually, it was uh, not part of their job. There was, the, the job was supposed to be done by an engineer from Marconi, and you weren't supposed to touch it till the engineer got there. But uh, they were two thirds of the way to North America and there weren't any engineers within shouting distance. So they uh, did it themselves, but it took them all night. And so Jack, especially, uh, what he did, he didn't, they didn't divide up the work e evenly. Uh, Jack liked being the operator. And so uh, he would work from uh, six or seven in the morning through to when the volume of, of uh, uh, customers fell off. We got fewer requests from downstairs and uh, fewer calls from other ships. If you saw a ship, uh, you always tried to contact it as you were crossing Atlantic because there was a lot of shipping. And, and anyway, for for general information and to check that everything was all right. So they both had a lot of work with other ships and with uh, uh, to Britain first and then to uh, Race Point, Newfoundland when they got within range. Anyway, so Jack was up all day the 13th working, all night fixing the thing, all day the 14th right up through the madness till the moment when the Titanic sank. So he was really beat. Uh, uh, Harold Bride, the assistant operator, uh, was, he was perfectly qualified. He, this, this was his third ship, and he certainly knew the, the code and everything necessary. But uh, uh, he, the only time he operated was when uh, Phillips would go off to bed, and uh, he would uh, take uh, the slower traffic that you'd get late at night. Uh, yeah, okay. Now... Uh, they struck the berg at about 11.50 on the 14th, just before uh, midnight. And again, ship's time. This, again, the, the time thing, if you try to go through this, is, it can be very confusing. Uh, they had good communications with at least 12 ships at sea and were copied by at least 28 stations. So uh, 
you know, the transmitter was doing its work uh, as well as possible. Okay, so how effective were the calls? Uh, there's 20, they contacted 24 ships and four coast stations, uh, reported uh, copying the CQD. Um, Cape Race, 410 miles, Sable Island. This is a, a sandy uh, curve. It, it looks about like that parenthesis off uh, about 100 uh, nautical miles off Halifax, Nova Scotia. Sias Constant Mass, which is actually on the island of uh, Nantucket and Seagate, New York, which is on Long Island off New York. So again, uh, no problem with, with distance, even when the ship was uh, in, in dire straits. Uh, so I guess the conclusion about uh, the, uh, the, the, the transmitter was that uh, despite having no amplifiers, the, that Marconi five kilowatt synchronous rotary spark and the nice receiver setup were very well designed and really gave excellent service for both routine and, routine and emergency comms. And uh, it's pretty clear that uh, the 710 survivors of the Titanic, the, the chances were very small that they would have been found because uh, uh, if there'd been no radio there, none of the ships uh, other than the Californian could see them and the uh, Californian didn't do anything about it. So uh, I wonder how the captain would have felt if he found out that they 2,200 people had died 11 miles away because he didn't want to uh, go over and see what was happening anyway. It's all speculation, but uh, okay. Now, what I can't get into because of the time is, uh, but it, the uh, the disaster was uh, was in the spring. In the fall, the ITU met and uh, they basically set up the call sign system we use today uh, that all ships above a certain size had to have radio and had to have at least two operators so that there could always be somebody listening and uh, a whole series of other uh, things, but the fact that, that um, I've got a VE call and UFG or, or M or E's, uh, that's all from that ITU meeting along with a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, okay, I'll just put this in uh, that uh, where I got the information. Uh, I am sorry, I can, you probably can't read it very well, but let me uh, maybe I could show this. Here we go. No, not very well. This is a book called Handbook of Technical Instruction for Wireless Telegraphists, Telegraphists by J.C. Hawkshead. Um, second printing, 1918. But actually, this is the 1915 version. And it was uh, proofread by the chief engineer uh, at Chelmsford, the chief uh, Marconi engineer. And it's all about the radios that I've just been describing. And uh, it's also a training book. Uh, so can you show uh, us again, do... please, um, Fred, if you could just hold it up again, because then we can show it full uh, screen. Oh. Yeah, if you just rest it there just a moment and keep it still, if you can, then I think people can probably see that. Yeah, that's a really now old the... document. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, what I'm holding in my hand is it, it, not really old. It's there's I found an outfit called Classic Reprints in uh, Pranava Books, India. And uh, what they'll do is uh, they have, I, I was looking for this book uh, and I was ready to, to pay the price for an original, but it was quite hard to come by as you might imagine. And uh, this uh, place says that uh, we have a copy and we will print, on, they printed this for me. They, they didn't have a run of 2000 or anything that you order a book and they print it for you. Hmm, and it was good. about about $20, something like that. Not not outrageous. But uh, it, it did a good job. The pictures are good. The, the print is quite clear. The, 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 I don't think I can show you, but, well, here I'll. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, um, I just got this a little while ago. And, and so I didn't have it before. And it was... It took quite a long time to accumulate all the information needed, but this book is wonderful. It confirmed a lot of those numbers about uh, uh, the uh, uh, side tone frequencies and, and how things worked and, and so forth. It was all all in there. And proofread by the chief engineer at Marconi. So uh, it's as, I think as close as we're going to get yeah. to the truth. I was going to say, yeah, definitely. There's, there's one other thing, David, that if, if people are interested that, that I 
It's a couple of pages, and it's uh, from the New York Times front page, Friday 19th, April 1912. And it's a, a statement made by uh, Harold Bride, the assistant operator, who was uh, 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 Jack Phillips uh, died. Uh, he, he died at, it is a sad business that uh, there was two types of lifeboats in the Titanic. There was lifeboats as you would expect them, rigid hull. Then there was collapsible lifeboats. And this allowed them to stack several lifeboats in one place, uh, you know, use good use of space. And the sides were canvas and they had to be uh, set up. Well, the collapse, collapsible B was very close to where the radio shack was on the boat deck. Uh, but there was no sailors there who knew how to, to set it up and, and so forth. And there was just all these civilians m milling around. And so when the Titanic sank, uh, it just uh, slid off upside down into the water, but it still floated. And uh, 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 Harold Bride, the assistant operator, uh, was there first. No, actually, Jack Phillips apparently got there first and he got on. And uh, Bride was, uh, he fell in the water. He was holding onto an oarlock, trying to help pull it in. And it suddenly a, a surge of water came along from the bow and washed it in. And he went in and he went under it. And he was underneath it with no air bubble, apparently. Uh, and he managed to get out, but he slipped away from it. And he was kind of floating around for a while. And, and uh, uh, eventually he got on and... Uh, was in miserable state, but stayed alive till the Carpathia showed up. And when he hobbled forward, because his feet were damaged, uh, he walked by the body of, of Jack Phillips. And he sort of always said afterwards, he thought that Phillips died because he was so exhausted from all of the, the, the many, many hours without sleep, where he, he'd he gotten uh, a couple of nights of sleep when Phillips hadn't. Mm. Anyway, if people are interested, uh, uh, this is about two pages uh, of the the verbatim interview with, with uh, uh, the assistant operator. Thank you. Yeah, well, if there's anybody interested, um, and if you're happy to scan them or something, you know, I can put them in touch with you or you can send it to me and I'll make sure they get it. Um, thank you very much, Fred. I mean, I know there's a bit more oh. to, to tell. It's, it's, it's an incredible story. Um, so if you've been watching this at home and you've got any comments to make at all or any feedback for Fred or questions, then uh, now's the time to ask them. We've got a couple of people commented there. Um, firstly, I'll read Malcolm G3PDH. He says, a fantastic talk. As an ex-radio operator on ships, I cannot imagine having to operate such a system. <laughs> well, it's uh, it was a, a two-person operation, especially when they moved all the controls into the other room yeah it took two people but uh they did it and uh i mean compared to the radios we all have today it's it's a, a different animal absolutely yeah well roger's got some questions for you he said this is what roger g3li sorry he says the captain insisted on passing private traffic before cqd didn't he plus there was a fire that was burning before they started or before they sailed sorry which weakened the hull. Do you know anything about these? Um, I've heard that. I've heard uh, that the uh, ri uh, rivets in the front were, were uh, oh, well, there probably was a fire in the sense that it was extremely common at the time for the coal to be a fire, the fuel, uh, because uh, it, it, would, uh, it would be covered up and actually it produced another problem that was carbon monoxide down where the stokers were working. Uh, but yeah, the, the the coal catching fire, and it was a devil of a thing to put out. It happened in coal mines at the time, too, and that was even worse for the miners. But uh, it, uh, I don't know if there's evidence. I haven't seen uh, anything which says that, yes, there was definitely a fire in the Titanic. But uh, if, if we had a stoker, he, he would know, but we don't. Yes, of course. Um, Roger also goes on to say, great talk, Fred. What bandwidth did the transmitter have and were ships allocated channels because selectivity must have been very poor? Uh, you're, you're exactly right. The selectivity, well, the frequency for commercial uh, use was uh, 600 meters, 500 kilohertz. Uh, and uh, it was, everybody heard everybody. It was uh, 
I've heard it described as a giant frog pond, and you're hearing all the different frogs go, and uh, big ones and little ones, ones with different voices. And what everybody was supposed to look out for was the CQDs. And if you've, if a C Oh, I think we've got temporarily, I hope, lost the connection. Operation. Okay, Fred, sorry. We just lost uh, your communication with you now. We've got you back, don't worry. Um, we just lost you. You were just saying, I think, with Q, uh, CQDs, I think, and then, then you went. Could you repeat that, yeah, please? Yeah, it's a, Yes, uh, there was uh, essentially 500 kilohertz was, or kilocycles in those days, was uh, the frequency. And, and the vast majority of marine traffic happened on 500. And uh, nobody had decent selectivity in those days. Uh, and, and due to the lack of amplifiers, because you could make a selective circuit, but it would absorb so much of the energy of the signal that you'd have nothing left to listen to if it was too selective. So uh, everybody heard everybody down there. And uh, if uh, you, you were supposed to listen very carefully for C any CQD, weak or strong as it might be, and if you heard it, you went silent. And uh, there was, I, I don't think there was a, uh, basically a strong, a strong station that heard the CQD would sort of take over and say, uh, I copy you, uh, what can we do, what needs to be done, and, and so on. Incidentally, uh, the, uh, uh, when the Titanic uh, struck the Berg, it was the first time that both uh, SOS and CQD were used. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, actually, let me just quote from this uh, article that uh, th this is the voice of, of um, uh, the assistant uh, radio operator, Harold Bride. Uh, I was standing by Phillips telling him to go to bed when the captain put his head in the cabin. We've struck an iceberg, the captain said and I'm having an inspection made to tell what it has done for us. You had better get ready to send out a call for assistance, but don't send it till I tell you. The captain went away, and in the 10 minutes, I should estimate, he came back. We could hear terrible confusion outside, but not the least thing to indicate any trouble. The wireless was working perfectly. Send a call for assistance, ordered the captain. What should I send, Phillips asked. The regulation international call for help. Just that. The captain was gone. Phillips began to send CQD, he flashed away at it, and we joked while he did so. All of us made light of the disaster. We joked that, the, that way while we flashed signals for about five minutes. And the captain came back uh, and he asked, what, what, did, what are you sending? CQD, Phillips replied. The humor of the situation appeared, appealed to me, and I cut in with a little remark that made us all laugh, including the captain. Send SOS, I said. It's the new call, and it may be your last chance to send it. Phillips with a laugh changed the, the signal to SOS. The captain told us we've been, anyway, okay, that's all of that. So it was uh, uh, the initiation of SOS. Mm. Oh, yeah. incredible to think now, uh, almost an everyday term for us, but uh, for those uh, people, it was uh, obviously tragic. When we when yeah. we talked earlier at the, the weekend, when we did a quick technical rehearsal, I was surprised to hear from you or to learn from you that um, some of the crew survived? Because I thought that most of the crew had died from the Titanic. Yeah, well, actually, that's probably a true statement that, that most of the crew did die. If they were deep in the ship, they didn't get out. Or most, I don't know, I don't know the exact, I've never seen a breakdown of the 722, I think it is, passenger or people who got out, how many were crew, how many were, were passengers. But certainly, all the people lower down, the engineers and the stokers and the mechanics deep in the ship, uh, they stuck to their jobs and uh, went down with the ship. Yeah. But uh, there was uh, uh, a number of the officers on the bridge were rescued. And uh, uh, yeah. I, anyway. I guess being higher up in the ship, they, they stood the best chance right yeah. at the top of the ship. But, but Smith uh, uh, apparently deliberately went down with the ship. He... Uh, he was up there, of course, he was running around uh, uh, to the bridge and to the radio room and so forth. And uh, he just, uh, he, as a matter of fact, he came back 15 minutes before Phillips uh, ceased transmitting. He came back and said, uh, you've done a grand job, son. Uh, now you've tried to save the ship. Now save yourself, basically mm -hmm. dismissing Phillips. Well, Phillips stayed there for another 15 minutes until 
The water was literally licking around his feet before he got up and he raced out. Yeah. It's uh, easy to think when you see a, a film like Titanic of, in a kind of entertainment environment, you know, it's, uh, it's sometimes easy to forget that this was very real and, and really happened. And, yeah. Uh, you know, you've, you've given us a real insight as radio amateurs into the technical side of it and how relatively crude it all was, really. Um, oh yeah you know i mean the sparks as, as uh, roger said you know that the bandwidth must have been huge of those transmissions really oh it was i mean with a modern radio you you would have heard the the signal uh, people used to say dc to daylight and uh just yeah you, you'd hear it up vhf uhf right on down to vlf and of course that's another reason that uh, you didn't want to make the receiver too selective without amplifiers because you're cutting out a lot of the signal. In other words, uh, today, if you, of course, if you look at the scope scan of uh, what our, a modern transceiver puts out, you have a uh, basically a flat band with no response and then a lovely sharp spike. And back in those days, it would have been a huge um, a hill, a shallow hill. And so most of your signal would not have been on any one frequency. Yeah, I mean, by the way, I must say one of the things, the facts that stood out to me was that you said that the antennas in total was a, to try and give an idea of scale of the size of the Titanic, it was about half a mile, I think you said, which yes. is, I, I mean, I find that hard to conceive that you'd have half a mile of, of, of wire to make the antenna, extraordinary. Uh, we're coming to the end of our, our time now, uh, just a couple of more points for you though, Fred. Um, John G VK2ATU says there's a marvellous Titanic museum in Belfast, Ireland, where the Titanic was built. So possibly when you're next over to this part of the world on a visit to see your daughter or something, it might be somewhere to go. Um, and also Malcolm G3PDH says, have you read a book called Voices from the Titanic, which were, inter <clears throat> excuse me, which were interviews of just about everybody? No, I, I, I've heard of the, the book, but no, I haven't read it. That, uh, I should put that on the list. It's, uh, yeah, I'd be interested in that. Thank you. Incidentally, there, there's one other thing that um, your, your listeners might be interested in, and that is that before COVID, just before uh, a, a group got together, uh, Titanic Incorporated or something they were, and decided they wanted to rescue the radio out of the Titanic, and they had to go before a judge, and the judge agreed that they could do it. And the thing is that the Titanic is just disintegrating, and, and most of the radio was long gone. It, it, it took a dive down the grand staircase. And what's left is, uh, it's, it would be very fragile. But uh, anyway, um, things changed during the two years that we've been plagued with COVID. And uh, they've decided not to do it. And uh, I think the permission was actually revoked too. So I'm, I'm actually, I I see the, the ship as a memorial and, and you mm -hmm. should be you don't go rummaging around in a cemetery. Why should you go rummaging around down there? No, and it's, it looks like as well, many people have been able to reconstruct what everything was and the Marconi company and all those records and, and yes. using CGI and things as, as yeah, I think I'm with you. I think it, it should be left yeah. as a memorial. And, and what they found is that actually uh, things like leather and cloth survive perhaps better than you might imagine. And they found quite a few examples of a pair uh, on the, the ocean floor, a pair of shoes together as they would be on your feet uh, and, a, and a coat or a cloak or something or other uh, in mm -hmm. front of them. So, you know, you're looking at one of the passengers or one of the crew. Yeah. So anyway, no, it, it's it's uh, go and look is one thing, but to, to dig into it, there's a chunk of the 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 side with some portholes in it that's in Las Vegas now. Somebody went down there and helped themselves and there's a fair amount of crockery which is, has come up too, but uh, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Anyway, I disapprove. As I said, I'm with you, Fred. Anyway, thank you very, very much for t the tonight's talk. Oh. Lots of people, lots of praise for you. Mike G4DYC, a very informative talk. Many thanks, Fred. Uh, Ralph 2M0 RHT, uh, excellent talk, many thanks. Um, Martin Alvey, fascinating talk. And Les uh, G0 DFC, fascinating, so much deep information, thank you. And then many others as well. And from, well, all, of, from all of us here, Fred, 
for the talk tonight and the insight into the radio and the Titanic. We thank you very, very much indeed. Well, I, I thank you very much, David. It was, uh, I, I enjoy giving the talk. It's kind of an esoteric thing, but I just got interested in, you know, how did they do it? And, uh, you know, full credit goes to the Marconi engineers because their understanding was primitive at the time. Yeah. And uh, uh, they did uh, did a very good job with what they had. I was going to say, it shows us, and you know, that how much we take for granted, I think, now here in 2022, just how much we oh, take yeah. for granted in the technology that, and how far it's come. I mean, people are quite casual with their cell phones, but who do you know that can explain the total technology? technology of a cell phone yeah no no one person i don't think oh me either <laughs> many thanks anyway, fred yeah thank well, you I, I might just mention uh, uh nothing I, I want to do right away but there's another talk that i i've given that people have liked and this is about uh, uh air sea rescue uh and there, there's a transmitter called the gibson girl i don't know if you've heard of this I but it was no. yeah it was um uh, a bright orange box that would fit between your legs. It was a, an hourglass shape, and it would fit between your legs. It came in uh, all the multi-engined uh, Canadian and American planes, and I think it was put in the Lancasters and other ones. So if you went into the, the water, uh, this thing uh, put out uh, 5 watts on 500 kilohertz with a variety of automated uh, emergency messages, and you either... It came with a kite and a bal several balloons and uh, a way to produce hydrogen gas. And so it saved hundreds of uh, aviators during the Second World War. And uh, it, it, it became part of the whole air sea rescue system that in uh, 1940, 39, 40, 12% of aviators who went into the ocean were rescued. And by 1945, it was 89%. And this was due to the Gibson girl, along with uh, developed the, the Americans and British, of course, developed a system and uh, they worked together on this. But anyway, it's a nice story, which mm -hmm. is quite I, a bit about radio. And, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure it's something that we'll be in touch again with Roger, who booked you for this talk. I'm sure we'll be in touch about that. Many thanks, Fred. Thank you. Many thanks to you. Take and, care. Uh, OK, you too. Seven three. Seven three. Thank you. There we are. What a what a talk. And as I said, it is something Titanic was made such a big thing in the film, wasn't it? Mm. That you could easily forget that this was real life. It really happened. Yeah. And to see this uh, and hear this insight into the radio uh, systems on board, it's been really remarkable. So thanks once again to Fred V One F A for that talk. Just to remind you before we go, <clears throat> coming up this week. Uh, we've got our GB2RS News on GB3MB at 7 o'clock. On Monday night, the Monday Night Net on GB3MB as well at 7.30. And then at 8.30, the 80 meter CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. And then next Wednesday, a week from tonight, at the 30th of November, it's our last meeting of the year at CNS. Hope you'll join us for that. The informal workshop on repeaters, bright sparks, and also a social informal for everybody else. I've already had a couple of messages as well, by the way, for these. So if you are interested in any of these, and uh, Paul, if you're watching as well, we've certainly got some takers for you, but do let us know. Um, and we'll be back again, by the way, in two weeks' time here for NARC Live on the 7th of December with a talk on space weather with Rob AD0IU. And that's about it for tonight. Thank you very much for joining us, and do please keep sending us your stories and your, your news and everything, then we'll continue to share that on NARC Live, but hope to see you, many of you at the school next week. But from now, from Tammy, Tammy M0TC. Bye-bye. And from me, David G7RP. Take care of yourselves, look after each other. Bye-bye.